Hey guys, Mr. Davis here. So um, we have already spoken a little bit about what is the theory of island biogeography. Then we talked a little bit about how that works with speciation and adaptive radiation and how um, you end up with more species from maybe one founder species. Now what we're gonna look at is the effects of what happens when you go from a large habitat down to a small habitat. Um, and this is actually part of island biogeography. So we're gonna take a look at that and we're gonna see how it plays a role in conservation. All right, so let's take a look. Okay, so um, we've already talked a little bit about extinction and I want you guys to take a look at this um, image that's around me. Um, on here, you have a number of different species of animals that uh, were native to North America and just are not around anymore. Um, the reason why I have this picture up is because uh, if we look at the fossil record, for every 10,000 species in the world, about two of them are expected to die off every century. Um, the thing is, though, there's an estimated 500 species that have gone extinct um, in just the past 100 years. And what that means is that um, we should have expected only about nine species to go extinct based on the fossil record. So animals are going extinct at a rate that is faster than we've ever seen before. What is the exact cause of this is the question. Um, we have a pretty good idea that humans are involved in it. And the reason why I have these animals, you know, up here behind me uh, with giant ground sloths and short faced cave bears and North American horses and North American camels and ancient bison and glyptodonts and saber-toothed cats and all those amazing animals is because all of these animals actually started to go extinct about 10 or 12,000 years ago, around the same time humans first made it to North America. So around the end of the last ice age, it looks like humans showed up about the same time all these animals suddenly went extinct. Now, they may have been going extinct already as a result of a changing climate. Remember, if climates change rapidly, animals that cannot adapt will die off. Well, we don't have short-faced bears anymore, but we do have several other species of omnivorous bears. We don't have saber-toothed cats anymore, but we do still have the North American puma, at least for now. We don't have dire wolves, but we do have wolves, timber wolves, and other North American wolves. Um, so the question is, did humans play a role in the die-off at the end of the last ice age? Uh, maybe, might have been part of it. We're not totally sure, but this is something that's an ongoing issue, all right? So let's take a look at how island biogeography uh, plays a role in extinction and how uh, changing the environment can actually stimulate the same effects that we would see in island biogeography. All right, so, uh, we want to talk about something called habitat fragmentation. And this is where a habitat that is normally one large section is maybe broken up into smaller pieces. A great example of this happening in nature is islands with island biogeography, but it can happen in terrestrial environments as well. It doesn't always have to mean an island out in the ocean. So a good example here is things like this. How about a, uh, how about a mountain? So, you know, when you go up a mountain, the climate's going to change and you can get unique habitats on mountains by comparison to the area around it. So if you wanna see this, if you take a trip up to Flagstaff, let's say over October break, you'll notice that you have vastly different types of vegetation and animals up in Flag versus down here on the valley floor. And a lot of that is as a result of a change in climate. So as the altitude increases, temperature will decrease and the amount of available moisture may change as well. Um, up in Flag, they get a little bit more moisture so you can support a coniferous forest up there, whereas down here on the valley floor, we have dry shrubs and a temperate desert going on. So those differences are pronounced as a result of geographic physical differences in the land structure as opposed to, you know, an island out in the middle of the ocean. And as a result, you have unique species that exist there that don't exist here on the valley floor and vice versa. You go up to Flag, you're not going to see some of the desert lizards and like um, animals that you have down here that need that warmer weather. All right, so then let's take a look at what happens when these kinds of events occur where you either have a unique situation with um, a, you know, mountain or, well, 
let's see what happens if a habitat becomes broken into pieces. So this is a concept called habitat fragmentation. Um, species change as they become reproductively isolated. We've already said that. So species getting trapped on an island, they're now reproductively isolated. But you can create this kind of isolation sometimes when you break up a habitat. And this could be due to clearing a section of forest to harvest the timber from it. Um, there could be a number of different ways that this happens. And I'll show you a few examples. If species are divided for a long period of time, they can eventually evolve into new species, but you can also lose biodiversity as a result. Uh, so if you look above me, you'll see this uh, weird diagram there. And that is what's called a genetic bottleneck. And it happens both in when you have unique species that are brought to an island and when you have a sudden loss of biodiversity. So when you fragment a habitat like you see over there, all right, on the far side, you see we've got a habitat, it was broken in half, and you'll notice that you have large bears in that center interior area because they need a lot of forest around them. Then you've got the other animals that live on the outside edges, okay, that are edge species, all right? When the habitat is cut in half, there's not enough space now for the bears, so you don't have those bears anymore. You may also have like the red newts that are on there, or the red lizard or whatever that's in that core area. Um, it's not in both of those, it's only in one of them. But you'll notice that you also have the edge species in the surrounding area. They may increase a little bit, but overall, because you have lost species and that top level of the forest, it doesn't have the same thing, um, that's a you know possible drop in overall total biodiversity. And this can get worse the longer those areas are separated. So next to it then, you have a picture of something called the founder effect. And what this is, is when you have a population starting on a small island, well, that island is only going to have a um, couple of individuals colonized, and they're all going to be genetically similar, and their offspring will have that similar genetic biodiversity, which may not be representative of what the original population was. And so overall, in all of these cases, what you're seeing is a loss in biodiversity. In the top where you've got that uh, genetic bottleneck, that's the same kind of thing as the founder effect that you have right next to me. And these are both cases where individuals carrying certain genes are gone, which is why you see on the left side of the bottleneck, you have a bunch of different colors, but on the right side, it goes down to only two colors. In the founder effect, you can see that you have a diverse population to start, only a few of them make it to the new place, and in the end, the new ones are all, again, similar. All right, guys, so what I want you to do is take a look right over here, and you can see how uh, habitat can become fragmented. So what you're looking at over there is a section of forest that was cleared as part of a process in Brazil to set up new agricultural areas, but what they chose to do intentionally was leave patches of land of different sizes to see what the effects are. So it actually made for like this kind of natural laboratory that happened as a result. So when you fragment a habitat, you don't always get exactly the same results because it can depend on how small of fragments you break it up into, how far apart those fragments are. And so for the past uh, 50 years, basically, scientists have been studying this fragmentation of habitats. Um, and if you wanna hear a really, really good recounting of exactly how this works, there's a book out there that I would recommend. It's literally called The Sixth Extinction. Um, I'm not being sponsored, but um, I would definitely recommend giving it a read or you know, giving it a peruse. Um, it's available at the library. There's an audio book of it. Um, it's really, really great because they actually spent a lot of time talking about this exact experiment. And what they found was that when you break these habitats up into these small areas, at first everything is fine. But then, after a year or so, you start noticing a decline in species. And we start seeing the connections between these species faster and faster. And eventually what you'll end up with is generally one, maybe two species of trees, 
and then a vastly reduced spe uh, list of species of other organisms. Um, part of it was they went from a, a number of somewhere in the range of 20 or 30 different species of birds down to basically just one or maybe two species of birds in these patches of land. And that seems really weird because birds could fly. They could fly between these patches. Well, the thing is, flying between those patches is very dangerous for the birds because they can then be preyed upon by hawks or other animals. And so when you do this, you limit the available food resources, you avail, uh, limit the available genetic diversity, and overall biodiversity takes a big hit even if you leave some of that land undisturbed. So we've sometimes thought, well, you know, it's okay if we disturb this chunk of land because, you know, there's a forest right over there and the animals will just stay there and then we'll use this and everything will be fine. Turns out it may not be fine. These little chunks of forest just don't work. They're just not right for the animals. Turns out we actually need, the, they actually need to have a habitat similar to where they were because this is that kind of rapid change that's hard to adapt to. And again, remember, if the environment changes faster than animals or, or other organisms can adapt, that's when extinctions happen. All right, so habitat fragmentation can actually be caused by a number of different factors. Um, so one of the big reasons that we end up fragmenting habitat is because we wanna use that land for something else. So uh, forests have a tendency to be cleared to create agricultural lands. Most of the time you can't actually grow cash crops in the forest. There's a handful of things that will grow well in a forest, but if you want to grow stuff that's, you know, the main staples of most people's diets, it's not going to grow there. Uh, if you want to grow things like wheat or corn, you have to clear that land and uh, set up a cleared field where you can plow and till that. So if you look right next to me, you can see that you've got a bunch of tilled fields there, and then you've got these little spits of trees and stuff like that that are still left. Well, that's a very fragmented habitat. If you look over and up a little bit, you'll see right above there that you've also got a series of fragmented habitats, but that's due to a suburban area. And that's actually a picture of right here in the valley. Um, that's a picture of one of the subdevelopments here in Arizona. And that's as a result of, you know, people just wanting to be able to have a place to live. So suburban sprawl is another reason that you get a large amount of habitat fragmentation. And then lastly, if you look all the way over to the side there, you can see that that's a mixture of uh, farming, uh, farmed fields as well as um, agricultural uh, uses along with, um, you know, it looks like there's a track there and maybe some, you know, light suburban areas and stuff like that. So, you know, a variety of reasons could be at play as to why that habitat was cleared from what it was originally. But ultimately what's going to happen here is that you end up with a different um, amount of biodiversity than what you had when you started with. And the big problem here is that when you take out a forest, all right, with all of the species that live in the forest and you replace it with a field of corn, you've essentially gone from a complete ecosystem down to a monoculture, a single organism that dominates that landscape pretty much completely, okay? Those are called monocultures. Um, what you're gonna see with that total loss in biodiversity is that you're gonna end up with usually just one, two, three, four dominant species of plant or whatever. And that means that in the event of a catastrophic change, a big disturbance, something like that, you may not be able to bounce back from that as easily. And this can range from, you know, fire, flood, tornado, whatever, to man-made issues. And when we start talking about um, disturbance and responses to disturbance, we'll see how having a rich, um, biologically diverse area allows for recovery of habitat. Okay. So what are some other effects? Well, if we then zoom down to the smaller mobile organism level, even something as simple as a road can cause a good bit of habitat fragmentation. So if you look all the way over there, not a lot of trees were actually cleared, but that habitat has been cut in half. Um, it might mean that you end up with a different mix 
that does not represent the true biodiversity of the area in terms of the tree and plant species, but it may also have effects on the hydrologic cycle, so water um, and how water flows through that ecosystem. Um, but more often than not, what you're really gonna see is that on these roads, you've got animals on them. And they may come to these roads for a variety of reasons. They may have to cross them at one point or another. You know, so like, you know, why does the, uh, the turkeys cross the road? Um, or why do the kangaroos cross the road? But when you have animals crossing a road, you increase the chance of a negative interaction with people. Animals crossing roads have a higher than, you know, average chance of being hit by a car or, you know, if somebody's walking down that road, that could be a threat to that person. And then they go and get rid of those nuisance animals. Um, so this can cause a lot of problems on both sides. And those roads can actually be a major reason why a species of uh, animal might, you know, suffer a loss in biodiversity. The populations may end up being cut off from one another. A lot of times when we have roads, like the one that cuts through that forest there, what they'll do is they'll erect large fences on either side of that to try and prevent those animals from crossing the road and, you know, getting hit by a car. Um, but what that does functionally is it separates the populations on either side. And so there's no longer going to be gene flow across them. Now, that being said, is it just these kinds of animals that are affected by this? Is it just roads? Well, no, what about something as simple as a bike path? Now to you, me, and maybe a deer, a bike path is no big deal. That's something that's easy to cross. But if you're a tiny uh, little organism like the wood louse above us, that bike path might be very difficult to cross. So the wood louse, those guys above me, sometimes they're called roly polies or pill bugs, depending on you know where you grew up. They're terrestrial isopods is how I know them, but I, you know, I'm a giant nerd who studied marine biology, so terrestrial isopods. Um, these guys are decomposers. What they do is they eat wood, they eat plant matter, they eat dead leaves, those kind of things. So if you have a forest with a bike path or something like that that goes through it, crossing that path could be very dangerous for these little guys up there because they're so small trying to get across there. That's an arduous journey for them. It may take them a long period of time. The temperature of that blacktop might be above what they can tolerate. Or, hey, they're out in the open. It, they might be an easy meal for bugs. So if you end up with one side or the other where you lose those wood louse, you've lost an important decomposer. Now, are wood louse the only thing that decomposes and breaks down leaf litter? No, but the point remains that you may have something that plays a critical role in the ecosystem that you don't realize until it's gone. So you may lose some biodiversity of those decomposers. And then if you have other environmental stressors, again, fire, flood, freeze, any number of those things, and it kills off that population there, you suddenly don't have your decomposers. If you don't have decomposers, you get a buildup of leaf litter, you have too much leaf litter on the forest floor, you have a recipe for a fire. Okay, so something as simple as a bike path can sometimes be the cause of it. Oh my God, this is terrible. What do we do? Well, there's a couple options. So how about remediation? So one of the best ways that we have ever found to remediate the problems of this habitat fragmentation. Now, not talking about massive habitat loss and things like that, but let's say you have habitat. It's just all broken up and scattered. Well, here's the thing we found that you can actually make corridors that allow animals to travel between them. And these can actually limit and reduce the effects. And really great study has recently shown that it may actually reverse the effects of habitat fragmentation. In areas where you had habitat that was previously highly fragmented, when wildlife corridors were established, so green spaces that connected these different fragmented habitats, either with stands of trees, meadows, or other things, they found that biodiversity actually started to go back up. In areas where the population of different organisms, so in other words, the total number of species had gone down after just three years of having a wildlife corridor established between these areas, the number of species started to go up by as many as five species per year. Now it's not five new species evolved. No, that's five species that were previously there returned. So this is a big deal. 
So if you look immediately uh, to my side right here, that is a wildlife corridor that's an overpass. So these are being built along highways where you have a uh, population of elk and deer and things like that. And they're being spaced out in places where a large number of deer strikes are happening and things like that. So the deer will learn to go over the highway and they can put up those fences without cutting up the habitat and the deer will be able to move between the different forests and stuff like that. Birds are able to travel between them as well. And essentially it's just like, you know, a walkway overpass over the freeway, um, but it's for animals, all right? If you look up in the um, upper corner up there, um, you can see one that looks like it's got some desert on it. Well, that one is a proposed wildlife corridor that has been pitched to the city of Tucson that would go across the I-10 uh, freeway down through Tucson, and it would connect two sides of the larger Sonoran Desert. And this could be extremely important for a number of species, including the Mexican red wolf, whose habitat right now is under a major threat of being fragmented beyond repair if this border wall that's being built is completely constructed. There's parts of that desert that are way out in the middle of nowhere. There's no one anywhere near there. And building a wall through there is going to have a massive effect on some of the last remaining completely wild populations of Sonoran uh, wolves. Um, this could be a game changer. It might mean the end of Sonoran wolves in America, uh, or in the United States, I should say. They may only continue to exist in Mexico because they might be cut off from the majority of the population and that lack of genetic diversity could be their downfall. Um, if you look all the way over to the side, uh, right over here on the bottom, you'll see those crabs walking uh, through that tunnel. Well, that's uh, the Christmas Island crabs. And those crabs, they live in the forest, but they reproduce in the water. So every year they have to walk from the forest to the water. Yeah, they're a species of terrestrial crab that lives in a rainforest. What has been done on the island is the roadways on the island have been raised up about uh, two feet, and every 100 yards or so, they build these pass-throughs that the crabs can walk through. Not only that, those pass-throughs have grates on them, so rainwater can flow down into there, um, keep them clear of debris, wash away anything. Um, the crabs are in there, they get a little, little drink of water and stuff like that. Uh, but the crabs, there used to be a major problem here with the roads on this island that there'd be so many crabs on the roads, people would, you know, hit them, drive over them and stuff like that, and the roads would actually get slick with crab guts. And it was so bad that you had car accidents from people skidding out on dead crabs, and it smelled awful. So this right here is actually improving things for the people who live on the island, as well as protecting the crabs. All right, and then the last picture that you can see there, you, you can see those tilled fields. That is a wildlife corridor as well. This is another version of it where you have a corridor that winds its way through a number of agricultural regions that connects forests that are in between where those fields are. This allows for animals to travel back and forth and it reduces the number of interactions that they have with those farmed areas. So animals are able to move through there and it reduces the overall economic impact on those farmers because now you don't have deer wandering into your fields and eating your crops. Instead, they move through the forest because they really don't want to be around people. Deer are shy, skittish creatures. It also reduces the chance that you're going to have predators going after those deer on a farm, which could be a threat to people or could be a threat to livestock. Instead, you've got these wildlife corridors that allow these animals to move through, preserves the biodiversity, and reduces overall um, habitat fragmentation by simply connecting these. So that's what the answer is. Simple answer to ha habitat fragmentation is this remediation by making connections, all right? And if it's that simple, it's not hard to fix and you can get people behind it pretty easily. Alrighty guys, uh, that's where I'm gonna end. I want you guys to take care, you have a great day and I'll see you soon. Bye guys.